to the UVA School of Education and Human Development. Thank you for attending the Education Research Lectureship Series sponsored by the Virginia Education Sciences Training Program and YouthNex, the Center to Promote Effective Youth Development. I am Dana Sox, a graduate student in the Educational Psychology and Applied Developmental Science PhD program, a VEST fellow, and a student at YouthNex. While some of us meet in person today at UVA and others may be watching this later from virtual platforms, we would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians and indigenous peoples of all the lands that each of us are on today. Dispossessed from these lands and continuing to live with that legacy, we pay respects to their elders past and present. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the First Nations people that call this land home. In addition, EHD is housed within the University of Virginia, an institution built and supported by enslaved people. We acknowledge and pay respect to the individual lives of the African people and their descendants who were forced to dedicate their labor to the construction of what is now UVA. We commit to working to redress the inequities and white supremacy that result from the history of our institution and honor their stories told and untold and their descendants, past and leaders present and emerging. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Miles Durkee. Dr. Dr. Durkee is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Michigan. He received a bachelor's degree in psychology from Pomona College and a PhD in educational psychology and applied developmental science Wahoo <laughs> from the University of Virginia. Um, he also completed postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Chicago and the University of Michigan. Dr. Durkee is a psychologist who examines the dynamics of cultural invalidations, racial discrimination, and racial code switching to understand how these experiences influence important psychosocial outcomes, such as mental health and identity development. Broadly, his research examines how people of color navigate racial contexts, modify their racial behavior to fit into certain environments, and internalize messages about their cultural identity from individuals inside and outside of their racial group. As a past high school educator, I believe Dr. Durkee's work on racial code switching, microaggressions, and racial discrimination has important implications for educators and K-12 leaders as well, and should therefore be considered when thinking about how to best support marginalized students. This event will end by 1230. Dr. Miles Durkee will be talking for approximately one hour and will leave 20 to 30 minutes at the end for discussions or questions. Please note that any additional personalized questions after 1230 can be addressed via email as other meetings will be beginning at this time. Thank you for attending the Educational Research Lectureship Series. Please join us for the next talk with Niles, er, Nelson, sorry, Nelson Flores on March 22nd at the Hunter Student Research Conference. Now, please join me for a round of applause to welcome Dr. Miles Durkee. Thank you so much, Dana, for that very warm introduction. Uh, so I have to admit, uh, this is a great feeling coming back home. Uh, and there were so many good memories in this room. Uh, actually, the first presentation I ever saw from Howard Stevenson was in this very room, and I was able to have lunch with him afterwards. And when I was going to the restroom, I saw that he's coming, you know, to speak with you all this semester. So I'm on the screen. So, uh, yeah, it's, it feels very great to come back to, like, my home, my family. Um, and so many familiar faces, too. All the faculty who trained me, mentored me. My first time teaching ever was with Italia Palacio, an uh, adolescent, um, I'm sorry, in the insight course. But, yeah, just so many great uh, memories. So... I have a disclosure, I have way too many slides in my presentation, so even this morning I was trying to drop slides so that I can get through everything on time. Um, so I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions, but if there's any more substantive questions, um, I would love to have a discussion with you at the end of the presentation. So today I'll be talking about our work on racial code switching and some of the psychological implications of these dynamics. So starting off with this, let's start with the definition of what is code switching. 
So the term code switching was first coined in the field of linguistics, and it was defined as the practice of alternating between two or more languages or two or more dialects within a single conversation. So originally, code switching was referring to as two languages originally. So one example could be uh, two bilingual speakers who can speak both Spanish and English, you know, alternating between two languages. It was further than expanded to also include dialects, where even if two speakers are both speaking the same language, English, you can switch between two different dialects of that language, where actually it can sound sometimes even like a different language. So one example can be kind of, we can call it mainstream American English, kind of like style I'm speaking right now, or you can switch to other cultural dialects of English, including African-American, Black English, or um, a Latino or Asian vernacular of English. So as a psychologist, you realize that linguistic code switching is a very important part of code switching, but it's not the only way in which individuals can code switch. So in psychology, when we talk about code switching, or at least the work in my lab, we have a much broader definition of code switching. So we now define it as a practice of, in addition to adjusting one style of speech linguistically, also adjusting their behavior and their appearance more to mirror the social norms of other groups. So one way to think about this is adapting your entire self-presentation, where it's not solely just the way and the style in which you're speaking, but it's your mannerisms, your behavior, your swag, some might call it even your drip, can be adjusted depending on what context you're in to appeal to different groups. And oftentimes individuals are underrepresented position or marginalized positions, there can oftentimes be a pressure to code switch to appeal to the majority group in that space, or we can call refer to that as the dominant group in that space. Um, so some examples of code switching, the work that my lab does looks at code switching on the form of mostly the social identities, your race or ethnicity, but that's just one social identity that people code switch across. You can also code switch across your gender identity, your religious background, your social economic status, your sexual orientation, even from your geographic region you're from within the United States. So across nationally the United States, we know that from the research that a Southern accent can sometimes be stigmatized on maybe in the North or the West Coast. So even individuals from the majority group who are from the South with a Southern accent, you can see them code switching their accent when they're in other locales and other environments in the US to try to avoid the experience of that stigma that might be associated with the deep Southern accent. So those are just some examples um, across the many different ways in which people can code switch and adjust the expression of their social identities in order to fit in within different spaces. All right, so as an educator, I'm trying to make this talk as interactive as possible. So we're gonna have a few question times, all right? So feel free to participate if you feel inclined. Very easy questions, all right? So this first question is thinking about all the different ways that we can code switch in our day-to-day -day life across all of our social identities, our race, our gender, our social class, the geographic region we're from. I'm curious from you all, how often would you say on a regular week that you tend to code switch? So we can just simply raise your hand. There's no correct answer here. So how many people say that they're pretty much never code switch in their day-to-day -day life as they move between spaces? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that, thank you. How many people say rarely? Okay, sometimes, often, okay, and then always. Okay, got it. So we got a pretty fair distribution of folks in terms of the frequency and how often they feel that they code switch day to day. So this brings up the question of how common is code switching in America on a national scale? So fortunately in 2019, the Pew Research Center conducted a national poll and they included a code switching question in that survey, which is great because the data set is nationally representative. So I also want to highlight, I love the way that they measured code switching. So although it was just with a single item, I thought they did a pretty good job of crafting a single item that fits with the way that we tend to define code switching. So they refer to code switching in their survey as feeling the need to change the way you express yourself when around people of a different race or ethnic background. So one, I love it's great because it is specifically racial code switching. And two, I love that they didn't only focus on just your style of speech. It really is adjusting your entire self-presentation, how you express yourself, and that fits directly with the way that psychologists tend to study and examine code switching. So what was surprising from this poll is that on average across all Americans, about a third of Americans reported that they racially code switch often or sometimes, all right? That is a really high number. So even in our own data, I've yet to replicate a rate that that's, it's that high. Uh, but I was really surprised to see that code switching is quite common for about a third of all Americans. So as you would expect, when they looked at different racial ethnic groups, the rates of racial code switching were higher for all non-white demographics in the United States. Um, but particularly for Black Americans, they, fall, they found that there was the biggest discrepancy between those who were college educated, where nearly half of all college educated Black Americans reported code switching often or sometimes, compared to about a third of Black Americans who did not have a college degree. All right, so let's talk about a little theory briefly before we jump into some of the um, empirical findings. 
So when we talk about code switching, we situate code switching very clearly within the broader impression management theory. So Irving Goffman is really like the godfather of impression management. So he defines it as intentional efforts to reveal certain aspects of the self while simultaneously concealing other aspects. So one easy way to remember this fancy definition is essentially adjusting your self-presentation. And even in Goffman's writing, he refers to self-presentation almost interchangeably with impression management. So the goal here is to adapt your behavior to try to have or garner a more positive evaluation or assessment from the different people that you're interacting with, okay? And this, the types of adjustments in your self-presentation are gonna vary depending on who you're interacting with. So it's not the same adjustment that you're doing all the time, that's gonna adjust and vary. So the important part to take away here is that impression management strategies, changing your self-presentation, these are universal for all human beings, okay? There's not a single person on this planet who doesn't engage in some degree of impression management, of changing the way that they carry themselves as they move between different contexts or interact with different people. But along these same lines, we're still finding very large degrees of individual difference, where some individuals engage in these impression management behaviors at a very high degree versus others engage, into it, engage with it at a much uh, smaller rate. In addition, uh, there's many different forms of repression management. So the work that my lab does, we look specifically at code switching, uh, but code switching is just one of several different strategies to try to manage the impressions that others form around you. So some other popular ones are emotional masking, um, and also for those who are capable of it, uh, passing as belonging to the majority group, even though technically they may not be a member of the majority group across any social identity. All right, so a bit more theory. As we talk about these impression management dynamics and self-presentation adjustment, we cannot have this conversation without considering power dynamics and how important power dynamics are in really explaining a lot of the individual difference we see in these rates of uh, impression management strategies. So starting off with social identity theory, I know probably most people in this room are very familiar with Tajfil and Turner's seminal uh, framework. But essentially the takeaway here is that people naturally categorize into social groups. And we also draw a strong sense of identity and even our sense of self-esteem from these groups that we belong to. And these social identity groups are very powerful because our membership in these groups, it informs the attitudes that we hold. It actually influences our perceptions about both the in-group and other out-groups. And it also influences our behavior and what our norms are and our sense of how we carry ourselves, all right? All of this is heavily informed by the social groups that we belong to. So as we're thinking about social groups, not all social groups are treated equally in America, all right? We have very large systems of inequality and power within the United States. So we can't talk about social groups without also considering intersectionality theory. And particularly for those who may belong to one or several marginalized groups, that's gonna create a very unique, distinct experience when it comes to managing these impressions and these self-presentations, given that these individuals may be facing multiple marginalized and stigmatized identities. That's gonna be a different set of societal pressures to um, navigate that code switching dynamic, okay? And then lastly, I want to highlight when we talk about think about this in consideration with code switching, we have to distinguish between voluntary code switching versus involuntary code switching. OK, so even with code switching, all human beings like impression management strategies engage in code switching to some extent. But when we factor in power dynamics, we realize that typically for members of the majority of the dominant group, in most situations, even though they engage in code switching when they do, it's typically voluntary code switching, where uh, those individuals choose and so they decide to code switch in certain spaces versus others. And, and a lot of times, if those same individuals, the majority group decided not to code switch, sometimes the consequences are very minimal. All right, it's a lot of oftentimes up to individual difference to decide if you want to code switch or not. But as individuals face more marginalized identities, then we see those stakes change, where now sometimes code switching becomes involuntary. And sometimes it's essential for survival. So if you're facing multiple marginalized stigmatized identities, when it comes to interviewing for grad school positions or interviewing for a job, if there aren't any other members of your group there, then usually what happens is to prove that you're a good fit for the company or the organization, those individuals have to adapt their behavior to fit in with the existing organizational culture, rather than the organizational culture adapting to a accommodate and be more inclusive of people from underrepresented backgrounds. So we do see this power dynamic. Um, and even when it comes to, we say, men of color interacting with the police. I mean, this is a situation where literally code switching, it can be crucial to their survival in those interactions to help uh, alleviate some of the anxiety or tension that uh, law enforcement officers may have towards their groups, given the way that they may view or stigmatize those groups. All right. So one more question time. All right. Another easy question for you. So how much do you think that you co your code switching has contributed to your overall career success or educational success? All right, there's no wrong answer. So in self-reflecting on your own degree of code switching, 
do you think it's played a role in the outcomes that you've experienced? So how many people will say really not at all? They don't feel that their code switching has really had an effect on their educational or career outcomes. Okay, slightly. All right, somewhat, moderately, and then extremely. Okay, I think we got even more variance in this situation, okay. So let's talk about an empirical study that uh, I published with my, so I want to shout out my amazing collaborator, Dr. Courtney McClooney, who was a postdoc here at uh, UVA in the Darden School of Business, right as we were writing up and getting um, a good amount of this uh, code switching work published. Um, so this study, experimental project published in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. The title of the paper is To Be or Not to Be Black, the Effects of Racial Code Switching on Perceived Professionalism in the Workplace. Um, so because this paper is already published, I am going to move through this paper pretty quickly. So if you have any questions, I can answer them at the end, um, or you can really read a lot of the details in the nitty gritty <laughs> in the publication version. But essentially, the goal of this paper was to answer the question, does racial code switching influence perceptions of professionalism of Black Americans in the United States? So to answer this question, uh, we ran an experimental study where we manipulated whether a hypothetical Black coworker either explicitly expressed to the participant that they engage in racial code switching at the workplace, or they expressed that I do not engage in code switching workplace, I bring my authentic self to work, okay? So two very different versions, one who's adapting their behavior and self-presentation to fit in versus one who's completely authentic at work and outside of work. So participants were primed in the study to, or instructed to evaluate the advice that they received from this hypothetical black coworker. Uh, they were also uh, informed that they to imagine themselves working at this law firm with this person. And as they received this advice, essentially the advice described the unspoken ways to succeed at the firm. So as soon as we recruited participants online, we told them, okay, imagine you've just been hired for this a new law firm. You're a recent employee. You're going to get contacted by a more veteran, uh, more veteran coworker at the law firm to give you some advice on how to succeed there. So we manipulated code switching through several specific behaviors, okay? The first is style of speech. So we had two different variants of this advice. Once again, one version of the advice was encouragement to code switch because the coworkers said that helped them survive at this company or thrive at the company. The other advice is I bring my authentic self to work and that's enabled me to thrive at the company, all right? So we manipulated this across the same exact behavior. So for style of speech, the individual reported being authentic and saying that I do speak in African American vernacular, both outside of work and at work. So my dialect is, you know, essentially consistent between the two. The other variant of that is the person explicitly, exp explicitly states that they do code switch. To say that outside of work, they do speak in a more African-American vernacular, but at work, they, main, they code switch to sound more like the mainstream dialect of everyone else at work. Uh, the next code switching is a name preference. Um, so each of the participants was gender matched to their hypothetical coworker. So for women in the study, they were matched with Lakeisha Renee Jackson. And for males in the study, they were matched with Lamar Matthew Jackson, okay? So if you notice the names in both these situations, the first name is uh, stereotypically black sounding. We actually pilot tested all the names and several hundred Americans agree that when they hear Lakeisha Lamar, they almost consistently envision a black American. But when they hear Renee or Matthew, they didn't trigger any racial group. We couldn't get any racial groups, so these names are more racially ambiguous. But in the name preference condition, in the uh, code switching condition, no, I'm sorry, starting off in the authentic condition, the uh, hypothetical coworker reports that I use my same name at work. My name's Lakeisha, my name's Lamar, and that's what everyone calls me at work. In the code switching condition, this person said that outside of work, everyone else calls them Lakeisha Lamar, but at work, they prefer for the coworkers to call them Renee or Matthew. And then for hairstyle, uh, same, we had two different variants. So in the authentic condition, the individual reports that they prefer a natural hairstyle and they wear that natural hairstyle work as well. In the code switching condition, that same individual says, although I prefer a natural hairstyle and I sometimes wear it outside of work, at work, I change my hairstyle to fit with more of the aesthetic of the work in that workplace. So straightening or shortening their hair for the males. Okay, so in study one, we have two studies in this paper. The first study, uh, participants received a voicemail from this hypothetical gender match coworker. And in the voicemail, they're receiving all this advice in about, it's about a one minute voicemail that they received. In study two, we replicated the same exact uh, script in the voicemail, but now we send it to them in an email on a formal law firm letterhead email, okay? So same exact information, just it was delivered in two different uh, forms to disseminate it to the participant. All right, so the sample were black and white Americans recruited online. Uh, it was a two by two between subject design. The first condition was the race of the participant, black or white. Second condition was whether they're randomly assigned to the code switching condition or the non-code switching condition. 
All right, so jumping into the results, our first and primary outcome was to what degree do people, what are their perceptions of their coworkers' professionalism, given the information and advice that they received, either from the voicemail or from the email that they received from that person. So overall, we found a significant main effect for uh, uh, both men and women in the study. Because we gender matched them with a the vignette character, we gender, we ran the analysis separately for the men in the study receiving a male uh, vignette character, women in the study receiving a, a female vignette character. But overall, across black and white participants, we found the same consistent main effect. And in fact, both of them perceived the coworker who code switched as significantly more professional than the coworker who did not code switch and reported, I bring my authentic self to work. And then we looked at the two by two interaction, looking at how race interacts with the conditions. In study one, we actually found that this interaction effect was non-significant. However, when we replicated the study in study two, where now we have the email that they received, overall the effects were just larger in the replication with the email. And we think it was larger because when you're reading text, we think people retain the information better when they were reading the text versus hearing a voicemail. It's easy to lose track of what's being said in a voicemail that's about one minute long. But for some reason, when it was read in the email, they retain the information much more clearly and the effects are actually larger. So the interaction was actually successfully significant in the same replication, but now just receiving the information via email. So we'll start with the effects for the male participants in the studies. Um, so overall, the main effect held once again for the code switching condition. So overall, black and white men still perceived the hypothetical black coworker who code switched as more professional overall. All right. So really where all the discrepancies happening is in the non code switching condition. So in that non code switching condition where that coworker says, I bring my authentic self to work. We found that white male participants were more likely to penalize the individual and perceive them as less professional compared to black male participants. We found the same exact trend for women in the study. So overall main effect for black women and white women perceived the black woman coworker who code switches more professional, but the interaction is really happening and taking place in the non-code switching edition. Once that person brought their authentic self to work, we saw that white women were more likely to perceive that person as less professional compared to black women. All right, so the next part I think is where the study gets more interesting because now we wanted to know what are their perceptions on the specific code switching behaviors, all right? So for style of speech, we found an overall main effect across both racial groups and black and white participants both agreed actually and have more preference towards the code switching coworker. They felt that code switching at a law firm was expected and essential uh, in order to succeed at that. They agreed more with that, uh, that variant of the conditions. Now for name preference, we also found a significant main effect across both racial groups. Uh, but both black and white participants agreed in the opposite direction, where now for name preference, they both agreed with the non-code switching condition. And these are, uh, you can see how large the mean differences is between these two conditions. They absolutely did not agree with name, co name code switching. Um, fortunately for each of these outcomes, we also had an open-ended qualitative response. We wanted to explain why they felt that way. And we were baffled by the name preference. Um, so most participants across the board said the reason they do not agree with code switching your name is that they felt your name is too closely tied with your identity and your true self. And they felt that if I have to change my name at work, and that's going too far. I do not agree with that. That is not okay. But that disagrees with about three decades of resume audit studies that show send the same exact resume out to thousands of actual companies. And simply by changing the first name or last name to trigger different racial groups, you can triple the callback rate. And typically names that sound more American or white up to three times the callback rate compared to black sounding names, Latino sounding names, and Asian names. And this has been replicated over three decades. So we know that names still matter in the workforce and hiring decisions. And even AI now has replicated the same biases where even the big companies, they found the same patterns, even with AI being more objective, but modeled off of human bias. Um, so we thought that that was pretty interesting. All right. And then the next one is we only found a super interaction for hairstyle, okay? And you can probably predict where the trends are going for hairstyle. And we found that the effect was actually only interaction only significant for women participants in the study, okay? So overall, in the non-code switching condition, Black women in the study were much more in favor of the natural hairstyle, okay, compared to white women. And we found exactly the flip situation in the code switching condition, where now in that code switching condition, white women were much more in preference of the straightening the hair compared to um, Black women were. All right, so what are the implications? So overall, in that first study, we found that Black employees who code switch 
uh, they are perceived as more professional, surprisingly, by both white and black Americans in the United States. Um, so both within our study and then other studies in the field, we know that code switching is correlated with occupational benefits that we found in terms of perceptions of how professional is the individual. But also there's other work that finds that it's correlated with educational benefits too. It changes the perceptions that teachers form about students when a student speaks or knows how to code switch to in class, speaking a mainstream dialect versus African-American dialects, which are sometimes stigmatized in classroom settings. Um, it also has housing benefits too, where even there's been some pretty cool experimental research where even calling to book an appointment to view apartments, same person changing their voice on the call, very different callback rates. Sometimes when it was a Hispanic or black sounding voice, the apartment would be occupied or already filled, call right back with a white sounding voice, now it's available and they can book an appointment. So we know that voice still carries weight across many different dimensions um, of our lived experiences. But uh, overall, so these are some benefits, uh, you could say, that are correlated with code switching. But with that said, code switching also has significant costs that we need to consider. So the first is that code switching is very labor intensive, OK? When one decides to commit to code switching, it's not that one day they can decide, you know what, I'm going to start code switching today. It doesn't work that well, because in order to code switch and code switch effectively, you have to convince the audience that that is your authentic self. If they know that you're code switching and aware of that, then usually you receive more negative outcomes than if you never code switch in the first place. And the reason that is, if someone knows that you're code switching only around them, then they perceive that as you pandering towards them. And then they feel uncomfortable interacting around you because they know that's not the true version of you. It's a quote unquote fake version of you. So in order for code switching to be effective, you have to deliver in a way where other people actually believe that that is the true version of you. And if you do it long enough, that may ultimately start to become a variant of you if you do it for decades at a time. But as we know, human beings are very multidimensional. So along the lines, because code switch requires so much experience and I would say precision in its delivery to be perceived as authentic, um, it's also very emotionally exhausting and it can be detrimental to mental health. Um, and it's a strong contributor to employee burnout. All right, and overall, the cost of code switching, they are similar to other types of identity threats that I've kind of mentioned. So like emotional masking and also identity shifting is another um, area of work where a lot of really exciting findings are coming, especially from Daniel Dickens um, in, that, in that aspect. So what are some of the remaining gaps in this literature? So recent evidence does suggest that code switching uh, can be a major threat to our overall well-being and sense of self-concept and how we view ourselves. Um, so if we look at think about higher education specifically, we know that overall higher ed is still struggling to recruit and retain faculty of color just to even keep up with the diversifying rates of student populations. Um, last time I looked at the stats was in 2020. And at the point of 2020 across nationally the United States, we would have to double the rate of faculty of color in the United States just to keep up with the at that point the rate of student diversity on our campuses just to be equivalent. Um, since 2020, we have not met that mark. So still, there's a major uh, discrepancy between the racial composition of our student populations and our faculty populations. Uh, so currently, it's also unclear how racial code switching is related to these occupational outcomes in higher education amongst university faculty, all faculty, but especially amongst faculty of color. So this next study, uh, so the next two studies I'm going to present are both works in progress. So I would love to get your feedback at the end on these uh, papers as we're writing them up to send them out for publication. So for this first study that I'm gonna share with you, uh, there's three primary research questions driving the work. The first is whether the demographic trends of racial code switching amongst university faculty. The next is what are the positive and negative departmental climate factors that relate to the degree to which these faculty are engaging in this code switching. We're gonna look at both positive factors of the climate that relate to it and also negative factors. And then the third is really our implications. So what are the occupational implications for faculty who do engage in this code switching? How does it relate to their overall job satisfaction and likely to even stay at that university? All right, so the sample is roughly 2,500 faculty from a large research public university in the Midwest. Uh, I won't mention the name of the institution, but I will say that this institution recently won a national championship in football. So, you know, go blue. <laughs> All right, so the median age of 49 years old, uh, slightly more than half the sample were female. Uh, only 27% of the sample were faculty of color. So that tells us that 73% of the uh, faculty were identified as white. Um, we had a good distribution across different ranks of faculty. Um, and the largest was about a third of our sample were full professors. 
All right, so here are the measures in the scale. For the sake of time, I don't have time to go through all the measures, but I do want to point your attention to the racial code switching scale because um, we developed a brand new scale just for this data collection. Um, fortunately, we didn't have to start from scratch. We had an existing validated psychrometrically strong scale, but the institution I shall not mention came back and said, your scale is too long. So they wanted the shortest scale absolutely possible. So we had to go back to the drawing board, uh, collect some pilot data to shorten our scale. So we got the scale down to nine items ultimately. Uh, we condition the scale when we ask each of these different code switching attributes, we position it as how often do you change these behaviors in order to fit in at work, okay? And the cool part is uh, we also measure code switching across several different social identities. So all the results I'll be sharing today indicates that these faculty, they reported the code switching so that they do this specifically because of their race or ethnicity, okay? But on the scale itself, we also measure code switching across your gender identity, your religious identity, your sexual orientation, your social economic status, um, what else? Your ability status. And I think that's six. Okay. We had six different social identities. I think that's all six. All right. So two of the main items on this scale include behavioral code switching, such as changing your style of speech, your demeanor. We also have phenotypical appearance style of code switching. So changing your clothing style, changing your hairstyle, other metrics along your appearance. And the last was kind of your, um, almost your ideologies. So changing your, uh, how you express your political opinions in certain spaces, and also changing the degree of what uh, personal information you choose to share with your coworkers. Okay, and the last outcomes I just wanna highlight are variables and highlight are job satisfaction. So job satisfaction is the average of three items. How satisfied are you with your current position, your primary department, and your overall campus climate? And then faculty retention, which is our like penultimate outcome, it was a single item, but it asked how likely are you to remain at the university over the next two years? Um, and this is a major outcome for the institution itself that gives them a, a heads up of if there's a potential pending wave of faculty attrition that may be coming up. And every school, and we have several leaders in the room who are running departments and schools and colleges, you realize that having the information ahead of time of how likely faculty are thinking about leaving, that's a very critical marker that can help to um, hopefully change dynamics to retain those faculty. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump right into the results for this project. Um, so for the first set of results, we're looking at the rates of racial code switching by race. Um, so I will point out the scale or the range did range from one to five. So overall, the rates of code switching, racial code switching were pretty low for all faculty, okay? It's not that people are reporting, I'm doing this every day, but we did still see some discrepancies. So black faculty at the university reported higher rates of racial code switching than every other racial ethnic group. And on the other end of the spectrum, white faculty reported the lowest rate of racial code switching amongst all the faculty, okay? And that's pretty much as we would expect for white faculty, because they are by far the vast majority um, racial group at that institution. Okay, so given the smaller cell sizes of the various ethnic racial groups, uh, for further analysis, as we start to probe across intersectional identities, we then unfortunately had to combine all faculty of color into a single group, because as you see, for some of the cells like multiracial, Amina stands for Arab, Middle Eastern, North African, there were just so few people there. Once we start to parse those, we were just losing power. So for this next set of results, you're gonna see racial code switching now uh, presented by race and gender. So we have BIPOC women, which are women of color, uh, men of color, white women, and white men reporting the rates of racial code switching. So women of color faculty at the university reported the highest rates of racial code switching, and it was actually significantly higher than both men of color, white women, and white men. Men of color also reported significantly higher code switching than white women and white men in the sample as well. All right, so now we're going to look across rank to see if getting promoted, getting tenure, getting leadership in your department, if that affects your rates of code switching and having more power in the department and less expectations to have to, you know, impress your supervisors in that way, whether that influences your rates of racial code switching. So we here in the legend, you can see we have our same four um, identity groups in terms of race and gender. And across the x-axis, we have four different faculty ranks. We have instructors, lecturers, librarians, assistant professors, associate professors, and full professors, right? So the key trends to notice is that for women of color, uh, we saw that the lowest rates of code switching were for those who are at the rank of instructor, lecturer, librarian. But once women of color were assistant, associate, full professors, the rates of code switching actually stayed consistent across all those ranks. So that's actually pretty fascinating because they're getting tenure and getting promoted to full professor, but yet the rates of racial code switching are not declining for women of color faculty. And then once we look at the rank of full professor, now there's a point where we see a significant difference between uh, women of color and all other groups of faculty. So women of color at the rank of full professor now reported significantly higher racial code switching than both men of color faculty and white women and white men. 
So for men of color faculty, we are seeing a slight decline in code switching, code switching once they're full professors, but we're not seeing that drop off for women of color. Now, the next step is considering that for full professors, all right, oftentimes, uh, so for faculty, we tend to spend the majority of our career at the rank of full professor. Um, and with that combined too, sometimes professors don't want to retire, so they stay in that position for a very long time. So we actually have multiple generations of faculty in the rank of full professor. So we wanted to further tease that to get at if age is actually varying amongst uh, that different uh, demographic. So in this case, we now ran the interaction by age. Um, and unfortunately, we got the most frustrating p-value that ever exists in the interaction effect, a 0.06 interaction effect. Uh, but we still probed it nonetheless uh, to look at where these marginal differences may be existing. All right, so the first difference occurred between uh, women of color faculty between the ages of 51 to 60 to 61 and plus. We found that those who were closer to the retirement age, the rates of code switching were significantly lower compared to their colleagues who were still likely at the rank of full professor, but still having much higher rates of racial code switching. Then for men of color, we found that their rates of racial code switching were higher for the youngest uh, men of color faculty, so those who are 40 years old or younger. But once again, we found that once they reached the age of 61 or higher, their rates of racial code switching were significantly lower. All right, so the next question we're going to answer is to look at these climate factors within the department, starting off with the negative climate factors, how these influence the rates of racial code switching overall. Um, so we're gonna, I ran the model multiple for multiple different groups. First, you're gonna see it for the full sample. Then you'll see that same model to see if it replicates across each different demographic group. Uh, the four main negative climate factors that we looked at are hearing racist comments within the department and experiencing incivility from faculty, students, and staff. So incivility is experiencing rude um, or rude, rude treatment, rude or disrespectful treatment from these various sources. So for the full sample, we found that all four of these negative climate factors all were associated with significantly more or racial code switching. Uh, for the effects, we have the unstandardized regression coefficient, standard error, and then standardized coefficient in that order. So for faculty of color, we saw, we found that receiving racist comment, hearing racist comments in the department, and then receiving incivility from faculty and students, these factors were associated with higher rates of racial code switching. But we found a different trend for the white faculty in the study. So for the white faculty, the one consistency across uh, white men and white women is that those who received incivilities, mostly from staff, that was associated with higher rates of racial code switching. And then for white, win, white women, receiving incivility from students was positively associated with code switching. And for white men, it was receiving incivility from faculty. So I do want to point out, given that there was this unique trend from receiving incivility from staff that was associated with higher rates of racial code switching for white faculty, um, at many universities across the country, typically the staff is a bit more racially diverse than the faculty are, because depending on where that university is located, usually staff are recruited locally from the local region. So if you have a large metropolitan area or a suburb that's racially diverse, you're going to recruit a lot more diverse staff members within your department, whereas faculty are sought out nationally, you know, and basically selected for their um, expertise. So keep that in mind, because that'll give some context to the future results that I'm gonna highlight in a little bit. Okay, so now we're looking at positive climate factors and how they're associated with code switching. Our factors are the degree to which they perceive the department is tolerant. So tolerant departments or departments described as more inclusive of people from various different backgrounds across race, gender, uh, uh, beliefs, um, et cetera. We also have their perceptions of how positive they view the department overall, just basically it's how much do you like your department, okay? So each of these are scales, I think they have like nine items in each. Um, and the last is racially egalitarian department. It's just the degree to which you perceive your department as being racially equitable. So for the full sample, we found that all three of these positive climate factors were associated with lower rates of racial code switching amongst all faculty. For the faculty of color, we found that it was only those who perceived the department as more racially equitable. That was a protective factor associated with lower rates of racial code switching. And then for white faculty, we found that uh, racially equitable departments were also associated with code switching, but in the opposite direction, you'll notice. So now for white faculty who perceived their department as more racially equitable, they were more likely to engage in racial code switching, okay? So it actually exacerbated the rates of racial code switching. And then for a tolerant department that was protected for white faculty, those perceived departments more tolerant were less likely to engage in racial code switching. Okay, so the last uh, question that we're gonna answer is uh, looking at what are the occupational implications, okay? So our pen ultimate outcome is faculty retention. How likely are these folks to stay at the university? We also wanted to see if that effect on faculty retention is mediated by the overall sense of job satisfaction, all right? 
So just a little bit of background. This was run through a path analysis with full information, maximum likelihood to retain all available data. So for the full sample, it's roughly around 2,500. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention the covariates and all the analyses were age, faculty rank, and international status. Um, overall, in terms of international status, international white faculty also engaged in much higher racial code switching than domestic white faculty. So that's the reason why we controlled for international status. For faculty of color, there really wasn't much of a difference between whether they're international faculty of color or domestic. Those rates of code switching were much more closer. Okay, so for the full sample, we found that racial code switching was uh, negatively associated with job satisfaction, higher rates of racial code switching, lower job satisfaction, and then job satisfaction itself was directly associated with faculty retention. So we found a significant negative total effect overall where racial code switching did have a significant total effect on faculty retention resulting or being associated with lower faculty retention, but the remaining direct effect of dropped to non-significant, suggesting that job satisfaction was fully mediating the effect of racial code switching on faculty retention and the indirect effect was statistically significant. So as you can predict, we then reran the same model, but now parsing across our different race gender clusters to see, do these same patterns now replicate across our different race gender demographics? Okay, so starting off between racial code switching and job satisfaction, yes, we find a very similar trend for all faculty. Code switching is associated with lower uh, job satisfaction. Then in terms of faculty retention, we see that job satisfaction, same effect for nearly all faculty on retention. Now when we look at the total effects first for code switching on faculty retention, we found that actually it was only for men of color faculty in which there is a statistically significant total effect. Um, and that total effect drops to non-significance after accounting for the indirect effects, suggesting that the effect is fully mediated by job satisfaction. Well, the, the other interesting finding is that the indirect effects, however, which is how code switching indirectly influences faculty retention through job satisfaction, those effects were statistically significant for all faculty. Um, in all race and gender combinations. Okay, so a brief summary and a discussion for this study. So we found racial code switching was highest amongst black faculty and women of color. Uh, white faculty did report the lowest rates of racial code switching across all ranks and ages. Um, so for the climate factors predicting rates of code switching, uh, negative factors were associated with higher code switching for faculty of color. Um, staff incivility was associated with higher rates of code switching for white faculty. And for racial equity, we saw completely different trends for faculty of color. That was a protective factor related to lower rates of code switching. But for white faculty, perceiving the department as more racially equitable was significantly correlated with a higher rates of racial code switching. In terms of the job implications, racial code switching was indirectly linked to lower faculty retention and decreased job satisfaction for all faculty, but the largest total effect was found for uh, men of color. All right, so when we think about this, racial code switching, are these results suggest that it is likely a threat to one's overall sense of authenticity and belonging that can influence occupational outcomes. Um, so particularly that threat to authenticity and belonging, we're seeing this uh, trend across other studies in this realm that are starting to look at these dynamics. Um, and when we think about the climate factors, it's really interesting how uh, the same climate factor of racial equity, how it's having very distinct implications for faculty of color compared to white faculty. So what I think is really taking place here is the racial composition of the department. I think that's playing out where departments that have more than just, let's say, a few token individuals of color, if there's a critical mass of faculty of color in those departments, I think that's likely to be perceived as a more racially equitable department. And because there's that critical mass, I think that's the reason why we're seeing that racial code switching increasing in those specific departments. Um, Unfortunately, because some of these departments only have one or just a handful of faculty of color, to keep confidentiality amongst the faculty, where we're not able to collect the department that they're in, because it would be very easy to identify exactly who those people are. So we can only measure just broader uh, units and divisions of the university. So we can't actually, even though we have the objective faculty diversity data, we can't merge it with this data set. Go up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I was waiting for that question. So I think, boom, there it goes. What does racial code switching really look like for white faculty? <laughs> exactly. Like we expected those rates to be, you know, almost near to zero. So uh, because I knew that question was coming, I actually looked at the individual items in the actual code switching survey, and we do see pretty wide discrepancies in which attributes of code switching faculty of color engaging in versus white faculty. 
So for faculty of color, the most common attributes are your behavioral attributes, such as changing your style of speech, changing your demeanor, your mannerisms to code switch at work. For white faculty, it's much more those ideologies. Uh, the strongest one was expressing my political opinions at work. So most likely these are going to be political opinions on, let's say, uh, critical race theory, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, affirmative action. Like that that's our gist of what that's probably leading into, because that was the highest item of code switching the political opinions I decided to express at work. The next highest item for white faculty was sharing, uh, disclosing personal information with their colleagues and code switching, adapting who they choose to share that information with. That was the next most common one. Um, yeah, so different rates of what's really peaking or what's most the most common attributes of code switching for faculty of color versus white faculty. But with that in mind, with the goal of trying to improve, um, uh, ultimately the goal is to reduce the rates. Racial code switching is stressful for everyone. Like, and you've seen through the job occupational outcomes that it is like the stressor that's affecting uh, overall job satisfaction and retention rates. So thinking as an institution, the goal is to reduce these rates of racial code switching and pressure that faculty feel. But for intervention efforts, that's gonna look pretty differently for faculty of color compared to white faculty. Um, and even the fact that we found that large total effect for men of color, they may also require unique interventions uh, to try to alleviate that pressure to code switch within the department. Um, all right, so for the second time, let's see, I'm going to just flash through these. Every study has limitations. You know, we had several. <laughs> so for future directions, definitely would like to track this longitudinal and see, do these faculty actually stay at the institution, all right, to be able to get that objective marker of do they leave? And on that question of what does racial code switching look like for white faculty, we will need mixed methods designs to really understand the dynamics within these departments and how why racial equity is associated with higher rates of racial code switching and what that actually looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so this other work in, uh, work, in, work in progress study I'm going to share with you is a very different way of measuring racial code switching, all right? So to realize overall, the work I shared prior was self-reported racial code switching. But when you collect self-reported racial code switching, you can very accurately measure the people who are consciously aware of their code switching and they know they do it at work. You can also measure the folks who are consciously aware of, I refuse to code switch at work, and I'm going to bring my authentic self to work. But the group that we're really missing and not capturing the most accurate are those who actually code switch by far the most frequently. These are folks who have been doing it for decades and do it quite frequently, where now they're no longer consciously aware of how much they actually code switch, right? Because when they get to work, it just turns on. And when they interact with even a different coworker at work, it turns on, turns off. And a lot of times they're not even aware of their own extent of how far the different expressions of themselves are going. So we call these folks our automatic code switchers. And the only way to really measure these automatic code switchers is to bring them into a lab setting, manipulate the social environment, give them social cues that might pressure them to code switch, and then you can videotape them and see how do they switch up in real time. So that was the goal for this study is to get at what are the psychological implications of racial code switching in real time in a controlled laboratory study. Secondly, we also want to know is do authenticity concerns function as a mediating mechanism that might explain some of these downstream consequences of code switching? All right. So some of the uh, most recent work coming out of this code switching literature suggests that one reason why code switching is so detrimental for folks is that for those who do engage in this code switching, it now leads to a sense of self-doubt is that I realize that my identity that I belong to is not valued in this setting. So now I need to present myself, change my self-presentation to appeal to the dominant group. But how does that make me feel? All right. Some individuals can feel less authentic. They can feel, um, we actually have data that shows that they actually experience more cultural invalidations. So they're actually more likely to be accused of acting white, et cetera, and validated as not black enough, not Latino enough for engaging in these higher rates of code switching. So it's really that coping process that happens, which we're gonna frame as authenticity concerns that might explain these uh, downstream effects. So for this sample, it's 111 black college students uh, attending a identical <laughs> public university in the Midwest. <laughs> The main age is 20 years old, uh, and the majority of the sample were Black women. All right, so I'm just gonna, this is just a condensed version of the methodology. Um, so we brought invited undergrads into the lab. Uh, when we introduced them to the study, we did have to use deception because we couldn't tell them this is a study about racial code switching. So that's going to prime them to either code switch or not code switch, depending on how they feel politically about code switching. So we masked the study as a study about mentoring dynamics, all right? And once they came to the study, we told them, that, by the way, you're going to engage in a live interview with an expert panel of veteran mentors, and they're going to rate your performance in the interview. And based on your performance, if you're rated as one of, if your performance is rated highly, then we're going to give you a financial bonus at the end. Okay. So we wanted to incentivize them to want to do well in these interviews. Uh, the interviews were brief. They're only about three minutes. Um, so to manipulate code switching versus non-code switching, we only changed about two sentences in the prompt, but those two sentences were powerful enough to change the whole way that people geared themselves to go on this interview. So right when they see the priming instructions, everyone saw a picture of the panel they'll be interviewing with. The panel was all white. 
keep in mind the participants are all black undergrads and actually show you the exact instructions that we gave them. So one condition was priming them to code switch. The other condition was priming them to be authentic. And we wanted to know would they switch up their behavior in real time for the study. Uh, we have self-report measures pre and post. And then of course we had to debrief them at the end because of the use of deception. All right, so all participants received this first prompt in the priming instructions. It says, in just a moment, you will deliver a brief speech explaining why you would be a good mentor. We would like you to discuss your prior mentoring experiences, including your strengths and weaknesses as a mentor, as well as the things you like and dislike about mentoring. Now for the act natural condition, which we thought would be like our control condition, uh, we asked, we told participants during the speech, we encourage you to act natural, be yourself with members of the mentoring organization. People who typically receive the highest ratings are able to show that they can be authentic in terms of how they behave and carry themselves, okay? So it's really our advice to them. If you really wanna get this bonus, you should follow this advice. Uh, in the code switching condition, they got this other variant that says, during the speech, we encourage you to demonstrate that you can easily relate to members of the mentoring organization. People who typically receive the highest ratings are able to show that they can fit in with other members in terms of how they behave and carry themselves. So as they see this message, you're seeing a picture of the panel. So basically, we told them code switch without saying the word code switch. But everyone understood the assignment. So they know it pretty clearly how to carry themselves. All right, so these are our predictions. Uh, we bet we predicted that those in the code switching condition, that should be a stressor, stressor <laughs> of having to change your behavior. So we felt that that would be associated with less positive outcomes, associated with more negative outcomes. We also predicted that these authenticity concerns is how people are going to then cope and internalize this pressure to have to code switch. We predict that that should be explaining um, these downstream uh, implications. These are the measures. I'm even further behind on time, so <laughs> I'm just going to... Flash and happy to answer questions about these measures um, in the Q&A. So I'll just jump right into the results, all right? So first, we're going to start with our self-received, uh, self-reported outcomes. So we were shocked by this finding, but I mean, actually, after we launched the data collection, we knew this finding was going to happen. So it was about within the first third of the sample. We just looked at the footage, and we found that we could not stop the participants from code switching. So even though we gave them that prompt, gave them the financial incentive, everyone ended up code switching in the study, okay? And the reason they did is because we used the Trier social stress task, and they didn't know this. So for those who are familiar with it, in the Trier social stress task, it's a very popular social psych test to stress your participants out. And what it does is very simple. You tell your panel in live interview to all hold a very neutral, stoic face, where they give the person interviewing no sense of validation, all right? So imagine you're in an interview and no one in the interviews give any head nods, no smiles, and you're just talking away. And they're just staring at you, just blank, blank face, all right? Everyone assumes they're failing the interview and they get stressed out naturally. It works very well. So what happened here, <laughs> what happened here is that our participants, before engaging in the interview, they actually plan to follow the instructions of their priming to get that bonus. But once they realize, oh, shit, I'm failing. I'm, I'm failing this <laughs> Guys, be recorded. Once they realize I'm failing this interview, people then switched up in real time and all switched to code switching. Because keep in mind, these are black students at a predominantly white university. A lot of them have prior experience code switching. For a lot of them, that's their like default when they're in unfamiliar spaces or in predominantly white spaces. So I'm just giving you a lot of background there. But yeah, so we didn't find a main effect of the code switching condition on their self-reported code switching at the end of the study. But in terms of authenticity concerns, we did find a significant indirect effect here where uh, participants in the code switching condition reported higher levels of authenticity concerns. So those self doubts about how authentic they feel about themselves. And that was then in turn directly associated with uh, higher self-reported levels of code switching. Indirect effects were statistically significant. We found a similar effect for the overall self-reported speech performance. Uh, indirect effect of code switching is impacting a lower speech performance through these authenticity concerns. And then we also found another indirect effect for their perceived capability to do well in a speech. Uh, once again, those who are experiencing more authentic authenticity concerns reporting lower levels of their capability uh, to perform well in the speech. All right, our next set of outcomes are effective responses. So we use the positive and negative affect um, scale. So positive emotions include emotions such as uh, confident, happy, joy. Uh, we want to know how these emotions changed throughout the study, okay? So we collected a baseline at the beginning of the study, and then we collected a post right after the interview to see how their emotions change. Um, so we found that, once again, this indirect effect was statistically significant through authenticity concerns, and it's explaining the change in positive affects. Essentially, that basically like a decline in positive affect is being explained by these authenticity concerns. Um, for negative affect, we saw that that indirect effect is now positive, which you would expect. So in this case, we're seeing an increase in negative emotions that's being explained by uh, this increase in authenticity concerns for those in the code switching condition. 
Okay, the last set of results that I'm going to share with you are the meta stereotypes. So we use the Susan Fisk um, stereotype content model, which says that many uh, racial groups in the United States can be classified into two dimensions, how they're stereotyped in terms of their competence and how they're stereotyped in terms of their warmth that other people have towards that group. So once again, we uh, so we found the pattern towards that uh, indirect effect, but uh, we found that frustrating 0.06 p-value once again for this indirect effect. So it's right on the cusp, but not quite statistically significant. And then for warm stereotypes associated with African Americans, there was just no effect there. Indirect effects non-significant. Okay, so to briefly try to summarize, um, so overall we did find that the study condition it was not directly related to most of our outcomes. Um, one reason that a lot of times it's not directly related is ultimately a lot of participants did switch up their code switching. But we still found that this uh, perception of authenticity concerns, it did indirectly explain a lot of our self-reported outcomes. We're still receiving that priming to code switch caused people to have a higher sense of self-doubt. And that ultimately did uh, explain several effects uh, once the interview was completed. Uh, so... Once again, supporting existing work in this realm. Once again, this is very new work that we do start to see a pattern of authenticity concerns. It's likely a working mechanism that is uh, explaining some downstream detrimental outcomes. Let's see, uh, for the sake of time. Okay, this is important. So people are impacted by code switching differently. Uh, so for all the results I shared right here, this is all our self-report data. But we also collected cognitive outcomes. We wanted to know the consumption of cognitive resources. We had them complete a working memory task pre-post. Uh, and we also bought some really fancy physiological medical grade equipment. So we collected their heart rate, blood pressure, ECG, uh, their respiration, um, and we took saliva samples as well to its biomarkers to analyze it for cortisol. So all of these are indicators where we can measure their stress. Um, we're still cleaning through that data right now, but it's very likely that the self-report data can be very different from how your body is reacting to code switching. So for the self-report, that's getting at the people who are consciously aware of how they're affected by code switching. But even for, let's say, our veteran or experienced automatic code switchers, if they're not even aware that they're code switching in the first place, they may not self-report being affected by this, but their body may still be aware. Even though their mind is protecting them consciously of the stress of having to switch who they are, it just happens in the background, uh, their body may still be more attuned to that process than their actual brain is or their mind is. So that's why we're really excited to parse out these physiological results to see if we get unique patterns that we would not be able to get from strictly self-report. Once again, every study has limitations. This one had several, but it's kind of our first uh, foray into this new uh, realm of uh, collecting uh, other markers of how code switching can be taxing and uh, potentially toxic uh, on the body. Um, for future research, we plan to continue the physiological work. Um, I think we've already said that. Um, oh, but really, too, so the other part of the importance of this lab work is it's really the only way where we can start to distinguish between these automatic unconscious code switchers versus those who are conscious. Uh, we will be unable to get that through strictly self-report. Uh, oh, another important part, too, where I, I get this question every time I share these results is in that panel, the participants were primed to code switch to an all-white audience. But people ask, what does code switching look like when you're pressured to your own racial group? Um, so that is a replication we plan to do. Uh, my prediction is I think it's going to be even more stressful when you're pressured to code switch to your own racial group, because in addition, I just think the stakes are higher because now you're going to be running the risk of receiving those cultural validations and being perceived is not enough to fit in with the group. Um, and from other work I've done, we know that receiving these invalidations from in-group members sting and carry an effect on depressive anxiety symptoms longer than they do when you experience these same invalidations from majority group individuals. So with that said, I want to go ahead and thank my amazing collaborators, Dr. Courtney McClooney, also Dr. Richard Smith, who is uh, one of the first doctoral students I admitted, is now graduated and out in the field, doing great research. Uh, I want to thank my entire lab. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Um, and feel free, if you want to follow the work, uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter, shameless plug, but uh, I try to repost a lot of relevant work in this area. So thank you. Yes, Dr. Matthews. So good to see you. Thanks for this work, Dr. Dutchie. So I have a question about like the faculty, the faculty study and some of the cognitive load stuff that you're thinking about now. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that like if with the cognitive load for the people who are have been code switching longer and uh, are getting the older in the faculty position, do you, would you expect it is lower because they've been doing it for so long? Or do you think that it would still be the same 
Yeah, great question. Um, so it's really like what's that? What's the causal reason of why we're seeing these lower rates of code switching for um, our most seasoned faculty? I'll say that. Uh, I think it's a two thing, a byproduct of two things. One, I think it could be that actually their code switching rates are just simply just naturally lower because they're closer to retirement, where they're like, you know what, I'm at an age where I just don't give a damn. <laughs> so I think, you know, some of them might already have one foot into retirement or planning. So in that case, there's just less need to have to put on this performance. Um, the other thing I think might be happening is that we might be getting lower self-reported rates is kind of because they've been doing it for so long, where now it's just like, you know what, that's just the way that academia is. So I feel like it might just be just self-report bias in that degree. In terms of the cognitive load, um, so my prediction is that I think that cognitive load depletion is going to be a lot more severe for more um, novice code switchers who aren't as experienced doing it, because you're going to be much more tuned to, am I doing it right? Am I not doing it right? Is that believable? If, do I, are they perceiving me as genuine? Like, I think they're going to be consciously thinking about the code switching as they're code switching. And I think that's going to just naturally consume a lot more resources than if your mind, I mean, the mind is so adaptive and protective, where I think for these more seasoned veteran folks, the mind is actually taking that out of their conscious awareness and the code switching is happening in the background, where it's kind of like a muscle memory, where if you do the same task long enough, you don't really even have to think about doing it. You just go right into that same kind of muscle memory. And I think that's the way that this code switching is happening. Um, does it still play a toll? We'll find out. You know, we don't know. I think it does still play a toll, particularly on the physiological side. I think our stress arousal system uh, is still going to be triggered by that. But I don't think it'll be as severe as someone who's consciously attuned to, I need to switch it right now, and I'm not that good at it. And I'm going to try really hard to do it, even though I'm not that good at it, or I don't really know how to do it. But uh, yeah, it's an empirical question. So with more data, you know, more funding, hopefully we'll, you know, be able to start to tease apart some of these. Yeah. Did you have a follow-up? Question. I use one more, mm -hmm. which is like you said you couldn't look by the department, but could you look like humanity? Yes. Versus, did you see difference? Yes. Humanity Very large differences. Um, so these differences are shocked. I didn't present them because that would just dominate the whole Q and A. So great question. <laughs> but um, so it was actually shocking. So the departments that are the most likely to probably talk about or incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion. So these are going to be the humanities and the social and behavioral sciences. By far the highest rates of racial code switching across all faculty. The Departments or units with the lowest rate of code switching, a lower, significantly lower than everyone else, were the health sciences. So this includes the med school, the dental school, and public health. Um, these are all fields where they're also interfacing with clients, with patients, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So in terms of shifting the audience of who they're talking to, academics versus patients, I would actually predict the largest degree of code switching shift amongst them too, but they reported the lowest. Um, so that was shocking to us. We didn't expect that the fields are actually doing the work, you know, in the social sciences and humanities, studying diversity, culture, difference, um, their rates of code switching, racial code switching specifically were the highest. But um, yeah, those are the main trends in terms of unit. But given the data, we can only parse it out by four units across university. So we have humanities and arts, social behavioral sciences, STEM fields, including math, and then the health sciences, which is everything in the health field. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So that matters so much because even in this case, so what we positioned as code switching is just them interviewing with the all white audience. All right. So I will give you the disclaimer that for some of our participants, they grew up in probably white suburbs, you know, in the I won't say the state, but right around the university. So for them, that's just their natural way of being, where they're very comfortable, you know, engaging and interacting with all my audience. So for some participants, they didn't really even have to code switch. It was just, I'm just going to be myself. Like, that is the way I talk and interact. Um, it's not the case for all students, but that's what makes the work um, just, I mean, like, you know, as you all education researchers, we know our participants, our students, they bring so much history and experiences with them before they even enter the school to enter the classroom. So in order to get the most accurate results, we have to try to, like, model these other you know extraneous factors um so yes racial composition does matter um for the sample and experimental study uh 
for 75% of the sample, uh, we actually can pull in their high school because we, uh, we've we self-recruited from our own longitudinal study. So we had a much larger group of participants that we've been monitoring for the last three years. Uh, so we recruited from that population first for the experimental project. But once we exhausted that sample, we then had to go out and recruit other folks who weren't in the original study, and we have less information about their high school experiences for those folks. Um, but yes, their racial composition of your prior experiences, their exposure uh, matters. Also for folks too, the folks typically who are the most adept code switchers are those who move between racial contexts regularly. For those, like for an example, is being bused to a different school district or living in a, if you're if it's you know available and you're fortunate enough to live in a racial, very racially diverse residential neighborhood or school, then you're interacting with folks from different walks of lives. You're probably even hearing different languages. Those types of cultural, culturally immersive experiences, it really starts to garner and build the skill set for code switching. Okay, because at the most basic level, um, every human being code switches to a certain extent. An example I give is: imagine you're going on vacation, and you're just as soon as you get off the plane in a brand new country or society, you don't speak the language, you don't know the culture. Your first step is like to read the room to try to see, okay, what are the cultural norms? Let me try to pick up a few words. Hello, thank you. So in that case, like that's code switching. So the one example I give is just imagine that that's your day to day life every day from the moment you kind of. We're born in the United States and left your neighborhood to go to a different neighborhood, you know? It's kind of like a similar dynamic. Some people have a lot more experience in that situation of moving between different contexts, developing the skill, and other people don't, where they might have spent most of formative years in a very homogenous environment, environment where for a lot of folks, sometimes it's not until they get to college, which is really the first time with that cultural shock of, oh crap, um, am I supposed to sound, talk, act like everyone else? And should I code switch? Should I not code switch? I don't know what to do. Um, and I think that's also triggering that those authenticity, authenticity concerns um, that we think is potentially a mediating mechanism. Sorry for that very long-winded answer, but yes, your speculations are right on the money. Yes, I'll come right here first. I'll come right over to the side next. Yeah, no, great question. And that's why I love mixed methods and qualitative data too, because we didn't even ask that question specifically, but thank God for having open ended responses where participants just gave us very valuable information. Uh, but yeah, so it's like that negotiation is actually quite common. So even within a predominantly white context, you know, if you have other individuals from the same identity, then what starts off is usually like a filling each other out type of situation. Like, hey girl, hey girl, all right, where you from? Like, it's trying to see, um, can I turn off the code switching? Can I trust this person? So it's kind of this sizing each other up to see, all right, can we be authentic or should we both maintain this performance, you know? Um, so that's on an individual basis. Like it, that has to happen with each person to build that trust and rapport first before that person feels comfortable kind of um, being their authentic self. Um, the other dynamic that happens is once that happens to, you have to do it in a way that potentially you don't want your other coworkers to see it because if they notice that switch up, then the other coworkers might feel excluded or left out. Of, oh, how come you don't talk to me with that same type of rapport that you talk to, you know, someone else with? So then that can create very awkward situations. They're trying to explain to them that this is why I don't talk to you <laughs> in this different dialectical variant. Um, the most common situation we found that in which uh, employees had to have this conversation is when they get a personal phone call from their child at work. Um, so parents talk to their kids very differently than they talk to their coworkers. Um, and that's oftentimes the first time that their coworkers hear this other dialect that they've never heard from uh, one of their black coworkers. Uh, so mostly happen, uh, mothers particularly reported getting a phone call from their kids. So they phone them like, hey, David, what you need? Or, and just they switch up their dialect completely. And even though they're in a cubicle, all their coworkers hear it and they're like, oh, Who's this other person? And then usually the multi participant report is very awkward, uncomfortable conversation with having to explain why they sound different when they talk to their children compared to everyone else in the organization. Um, so yes, that negotiation does happen. Um, so down the road, we have an idea, actually we already have it, programmed in Qualtrics. Um, so beyond an idea, but we want to get more to um, experiential sampling to get out on the day-to-day -day proximal level, you know, multiple times throughout the day, what are your rates of code switching? So essentially it would be pinging people's phones multiple times throughout the day to see, okay, what level of code switching you're engaging in right now? And most importantly, who's in the room with you? Let's see.
Yeah, no, oh, that's yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah, so I imagine on the physio side, that'll happen much faster. Uh, I learned through trial and error. On the cortisol side, through saliva, it's a much longer process of that recovery. And even though our study was an hour and a half with participants, it was not long enough to get the recovery from folks. Um, so you would need a much longer study to try to get that recovery on the cortisol level. But we're cleaning through the other physio data. Um, but that physio dating happen within a few minutes. It can be pretty quickly. Your heart rate can come right back down. And then it can scale up again, too, if there's any type of envir environmental trigger. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you want to wait Yeah, so the answer to that latter part, we haven't done that yet. So we'll be doing that next uh, to look at measurement and variance across kind of all the different identities. I mean, luckily the sample's big enough where we can parse it um, quite a bit to see any discrepancies there. Um, yes, so that is kind of like the million dollar question that we were really shocked by, especially the fact that perceiving your department is more racially equitable exacerbated racial code switching for just white faculty. Um, so given that the prompt said, to what degree do you adjust these behaviors to fit in at work because of your race? I think what's happening here is that, yes, yeah, power dynamics do matter. And these, the white faculty are still, across most departments, are still going to be the numerical majority. Okay. So in that case, then I think the power dynamic is going to shift right there, where it's more of what are our values and norms that we're embracing. And for many of the departments across the university, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a strong priority to really uh, implement within all aspects of the department. So both in the curriculum, uh, both with the personnel, um, and just both in soft there. So I think along those lines, I think we have kind of a neg negotiation that's happening here of, you know, so once again, the two items that really jumped out were um, uh, uh, my political opinions about potentially these dynamics. Uh, and that can be both, it's just political opinions the way we worded it. So we don't know if that's political opinions immediately about policies the university is promoting or whether these are broader national political opinions that they may not feel comfortable talking about with coworkers at work um, and then sharing uh, disclosing personal information with folks. Um, so it could be the possibility that that personal information or those political opinions just contrast with the other messages that are more of like being uh, perceived as like the norm or the values of the department. Um, and the fact that the racial equity was the one that's kind of, you know, associating strongly with that association, it's probably along those lines. Um, of that. So I know I kind of halfway, I halfway answer your question, but really we don't know yet. So really to get that definitive answer is going to require mixed methods to really interview these folks. Um, so I have a colleague who is very fascinated by that. Um, so we're in talks now to launch a follow-up study uh, to do some intergroup interviews to try to, uh, yeah, dissect that to see what's playing out there. I just think, you know, I think there is a really theoretical to be Mm -hmm. My question was really about the job satisfaction, um, some of the things that have analyses. Um, so basically, if I'm following, this is more of a like, did I get this right? Um, but if I'm following, um, Black women were more likely to engage in racial coaching across ranks. Yes. Higher than Black men. Um, black men had somewhat of a drop once they got to full professor. However, when you look at job satisfaction as a mediator between retention and retention, there is an indirect mediator for both black men mm -hmm. and black women. Yes. But for black men, this is a part of the retention. This is a take home message. Job satisfaction appears to be playing a stronger role. Am I getting that right? Yes. So it was, uh, so. For Black men, they were the only group that we found there was just this overall total effect of code switching impacting faculty retention. So even if we have no other variables in the model, code switching is directly impacting faculty retention for the Black men. Um, but this job satisfaction is fully explaining that effect. 
So once we account for that detrimental effect on job satisfaction, now we just eliminated, or basically it's explaining how code switching is impacting faculty retention. Um, for the other groups, it was just only the indirect effect was significant. So code switching is related to job satisfaction and indirectly through job satisfaction, it impacts faculty retention. So that's why I emphasize for the black men, we're really finding just, I mean, the largest effect overall because it is having that total effect. Um, what shocked me the most is that, I mean, I don't know if we should lead into it all that much, but for uh, white men, after accounting for the effect of job satisfaction, then code switching becomes statistically significant in the opposite direction, where higher rates of code switch, racial code switching, higher faculty retention. But I, I don't want to lean into that much because it's dependent on everything else being controlled for, accounted for. But it's just shocking that their indirect effects swung so far the other way where it now made that remaining direct effect statistically significant. So I don't know what to say about that. I don't know. I don't, we have more than many stats folks in the room that you can give me some insight on that, but like I'm fascinated about what, yeah, how to interpret that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, we thought it would be more accurate to gender match because, um, I mean, the experience for Black women is just, I mean, with intersectionality, it's just fundamentally different from the experience for Black men, the way they're stereotyped in the workplace, the way they're perceived by their colleagues. Um, so we just thought it would be more appropriate to um, try to eliminate that level of, I would say, uh, bias error by keeping everything within gender. Um, and then running the same effects, yeah. So for the most part, all the results were exactly identical across gender. It was only for hairstyle, where we found that unique effect just for women that wasn't um, carrying out for men in the study. But all the other effects were exactly the same across gender. Yes. In the area of social media, like a demand for authenticity is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe attitudes are changing about switching. People are more people unlike themselves on TikTok. It's definitely mm -hmm. like I'm wondering how how your like your age in relation to the way you grew up is affecting these things. Yeah, thank you for that question. So for that, like, I would definitely want to thank my training and the EPADS program of, I approach every question as a developmental question. Like, it's just with the training, like, that's how I've seen my problems where I'm like, how does this develop over time? So as soon as we see these effects, my first question of, okay, is this a developmental pattern that just happens with aging? Is it that as you age, and particularly as, it isn't until you get close to those retirement years where close switch, close switch just takes a nosedive after that, or is it like a generational difference? And I think we are seeing some evidence that it could be a factor of both. So on the generational side, I mean, since 2020 and the um, kind of racial reckoning with the United States, even a little bit before that, I would say with Beyonce's Lemonade album. I mean, we've definitely seen this appreciation of Black culture and Black artists being unapologetically Black. And I think that's motivated a lot of Gen Z and that generation to realize, you know what, I'm just going to be my authentic self, where we didn't see that same sense of kind of Black Pride since I would say like the 60s, you know, with the Black Pride movement, the Black Panthers. So it definitely skipped a few generations and now we're seeing this emergence. So that could definitely have a cohort effect and be a generational dynamic where that generation may uniquely not code switch as much as others. Uh, my prediction is that I think, you know, and what I know about college students now having studied them for over a decade is that I think two of what the social capital is differs across different age periods. So I think for college students, Gen Z adolescents, there's so much more social capital about being authentic, true to yourself, keeping it 100, not putting it on, like all these things, just being genuine. Uh, and then when folks hit the workforce <laughs> or hit the job market or, you know, hit the, you know, get their first mortgage, I think we see a decline in code switching where now there's a little bit more conformity of, okay, I need to learn how to play the system to get that promotion, to get this job, to enhance my, you know, my income, you know? So, so I, I think we do see a shift there, but I mean, we will really need some intensive data to be able to track, is it a developmental pattern that we just see shift as your, your roles change in life and you develop to different stages of life or are they genuinely generational cohort effects? Um, could be a combination of both. Yes, Nancy, and I'll just come back to the room. That, that last point you were talking about developmentally, I'm curious if you've ever also, particularly as you look at college students and younger, think about racial ethnic identity development, because I'm also thinking about the steps, right? So if yeah. I'm thinking about this, and I can also envision how that intersects with one, I can't code switch, because then that's not necessarily, okay. contradicts my desire 
to explore and commit to. Right? So I'm wondering if you've ever looked at the Relation. Yes, so we have racial ethnic identity in every project we do. <laughs> it's always in there. Um, so we're not getting consistent patterns. And I think the reason we're not getting consistent patterns is because we're just not capturing all the variables, I think, that are just changing these dynamics. Um, so going back to your question, too, so much of it matters is what's your prior racial context that you were exposed to. Regardless of your racial identity, that context is going to influence whether you even have to code switch or not. Um, whether you've already been exposed to different environments to learn how to code switch. Like, so I think those factor, contextual factors probably are going to overpower the effects even more. So I think once we can account for that variance, then what's remaining, I think, is going to be largely correlated with uh, your ethnic identity, your ethnic racial identity, and how what race means to you. But I think if we only focus on just ethnic racial identity and don't factor in these contextual factors of just people's background, socialization, and training, what they're used to, we're only getting part of the puzzle. So, um, and across the projects, some projects we have, we have very detailed information about that prior context and background, other ones we don't. So that's why I, there's just not a consistent pattern that we found. So that's why I can't definitively speak to how strongly ethnic racial identity is related. It is related, but just it's not always consistent because uh, these factors can change things. But yeah, but it's definitely on our radar for sure. Um, what I think too is I think it might play even more of a role in how you cope with the code switching once it happens. I think depending on what race means to you, that probably is gonna maybe a protective buffering effect or exacerbating those authenticity concerns about your identity and yourself and that self-doubt. So that's kind of the direction we're leaning is to see how it kind of buffers on that side um, rather than the overall rates of code switching. Thanks. Okay, so. Yeah. No problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're not code switching the ones. Yes. Yep. No, no, that's exactly. Yeah, that's that's the point. <laughs> Yeah, that is a great point. I mean, amongst the more junior faculty, we are going to get a lot more variance there, you know, especially the pre-tenured ones. Um, and that's exactly what I was, yeah. So we also had that same exact mindset for the most senior faculty that we have. They are the ones that thought that, you know what, I'm going to stay here, that something must be keeping them there. And that could be their rates of code switching might be that factor of they've, you know, found a formula that worked for them. Versus for other folks, if it didn't work for them, they would have already left. I mean, if we're seeing these rates on retention just over the next two years that they're projecting, that's a sign that folks who are probably experiencing the most pressure to racially code switch may be leaving going to another environment. Uh, talking with our university leaders that are running a lot of the initiatives at this institution about diversity um, strategies to implement, uh, I talked to them about, and they're very, faculty attrition is number one on their radar of how can we retain the highly talented faculty that we have? Um, and their concern is uh, if any, if you can even find another environment where you're not pressured to code switch. Like, what does that other university look like where you're going to face zero pressure to code switch? Like, so, and I agree, there's going to be different tiers and different levels of pressure. So the goal is to find the most, you know, conducive environment. But I do agree that it's probably nearly impossible to find a space where you don't have to code switch at all in that space. Like, uh, and it, it may be, yeah, I'll stop there. But I can go on for a lot of thoughts about that. Yeah, but thanks, thanks for that comment. Advising a university, let's just say one even like this, where you're very familiar with the What would be some advice that you would give to both like white faculty members in a high position of power, maybe white students in a lower position of power, black faculty members in a high versus you know, black students in a low position of power? Like, how would you advise these different stakeholders? Mm -hmm. like, to act in a way that could potentially mitigate some of the harmful Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I had a whole slide on policy implications in higher education. I'm not gonna put the slide up because I'll spend 20 minutes on that slide, too long, we only have a few minutes left. Um, but I think the first and foremost easiest step is that all organizations, you need to do regular climate evaluations. And the reason that's necessary is because the folks who are most effective at the code switching, who are doing it the most, 
organizational leaders are unaware that they're even doing it because they're never going to see that other side. They only see the side at work. So they have no idea that these people are switching up that much and feeling that pressure to have to change their self-presentation. So through these regular climate evaluations, they have to be anonymous too. So that's how we couldn't collect department because if people know you can identify them, they're not going to be honest. So you need to make it as confidential as you possibly can um, so that they can be honest in the data that you're collecting. Um, so with that point, at least you can start to identify which intersectional groups are facing the highest pressure. Because if you don't know where to act, then I mean, one size fits all interventions never work, all right? Our interventions need to be tailored to the actual demographic who's experiencing that pressure in a unique way. So those, the climate evaluations can help you identify the groups experiencing the most pressure. Then you can reach out to the heads of those departments, put it on their radar, because likely their department chairs or deans, depending on how high you want to go up the chain of command, they're also not aware of this happening too. So you can put it on their radar. Then you can start to develop, okay, either programming or bringing in consultants or bringing in other folks to try to understand what can we do to make the space more inclusive. Um, so when I give talks to organizations and companies, um, the first thing I always tell them to do is that most companies have code of contact or professional standards that their company has, all right? For most companies, these professional standards were written when the company first started, which could be decades ago. And we could think about who was in the room at that time to write these professional standards. Typically, it's very senior white men who set the standards and code of conduct of this is how you should appear, this is how you should behave, this is how your hair should look like, what your attire should look like. And basically all the social norms were modeled around their preferences. But now our workforce has diversified and looks very different. So we have to go back and readjust those professional standards so that they're actually working for the members of our organization and not just archaic and outdated. So definitely for like things like the Crown Act and like hair kind of policing and rules, you know, these, these policies are very outdated. So there are sometimes very simple things we can do that have, you know, huge levels of change in terms of in terms of your members feeling, you know, more inclusive in that space. With that said, it's not easy. One diversity training is never going to work. So sometimes organizations want that quick fix and they have to realize this is a long term change because it takes a long time to change um, organizational cultures. You know, that's a, a year long process or years long to try to shift that over time. Um, but if you're having these conversations and you have people in the room to start kind of questioning these things, then over time we can start to shift that. So sorry, I don't have a quick answer for you, but I mean, there's several things we can do, but they do take commitment though from the leadership it has to come from top down too. It can't just be also the entry level folks demanding this change because then at some point they might hit a glass ceiling. I think we might have time for two more or one or two more questions. Yeah, Sarah. When you were talking about the differences between the discipline. And you know, I'm wondering about is there an element of self awareness mm -hmm. that's happening? What can you explain what you think is happening and also in the you know in the risk of being restricted in correlation data? Mm -hmm. Um just you know, sort of shed some light on what recommendations might come from that specific you know, if you were talking about social science. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I can share that it's really the, I mean, it's also the faculty in the social science and humanities. There really are leaders who are leading the whole DEI movement on the entire campus. Like they're the folks who are in those leaders. They're the ones, you know, championing the cause across the university. So in these divisions of the university, these are departments where, you know, aspects of DEI are just talked about way more frequently than you're going to find in the natural sciences, you know, for example. So I think, yeah, part of it may be just that salience and the fact that we have more conversations about inclusivity, diversity on a day-to-day -day basis or, on a, or in our faculty meetings. So if it's more salient, that people may be more attuned to their racial behavior um, and adjusting it towards to fit in. Um, at that point, it is a little depressing too to find that because the goal is that they're still changing their racial behavior rather than bringing their authentic selves, even though these 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 topics may be discussed more in these units. Um, so I once again, I don't have a definitive answer. What uh, we can just speculate at this point, but my primary speculation is I think probably that saliency is probably maybe one of the factors at first that might be leading to these these rates. But it is unfortunate at the end of the day, too, that with that saliency, we're not seeing more inclusivity, where people are feeling more comfortable just being authentic. They're still, they're putting even more effort to code switch in these spaces. Uh, but yeah, we'll need more data. Uh, the good news is that the university is very interested in unpacking some of these things to actually ask us to collect more data on faculty. Um, to try to um, answer some of these unanswered questions. Yeah, so to be continued. Uh, 
Awesome. Thank you so much.